Well, Greenfields is great for everything, really. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Here we go in. going to go ahead and get started. It is so wonderful to see a full house today with standing room only. So um, there are a couple chairs in here if you still need a chair, uh, a couple um, throughout. Um, if you guys don't know me, my name is uh, Marissa Blackburn. I am the environmental education manager here at Cape Fear River Watch. Um, and I coordinate our first Saturday seminar series. So um, I, many of you guys are familiar faces and have been to many seminars, and some of you are new. So thank you for joining us if this is your first time. Um, we host these every single month on the first Saturday of the month. Um, I always like to do a couple announcements and reminders at the start about Cape Fear River Watch. Um, so I do always like to do a quick board member shout out for past and current board members. So if you're a past or current board member, could you please stand up here for just a second? I know we have a couple in the crowd. Thank you, guys. <laughs> All right. Um, I also wanted to give a thank you to TK and CB, CB of Coastal Carolina Network who are filming for us today in the back and have been filming for us for about a year now. We really appreciate it. And we upload these videos to our YouTube channel um, the following week. So if you, missed, uh, if you missed one of our previous seminars you wanted to see or you really enjoy today's and you want to share it with your friends, um, you can find all those recordings on our website and on our YouTube. Um, we do have a donation jar in the front um, if you'd like to make a donation today while you're here. Um, and then for our upcoming events, today at Waterline Brewing, um, from 1 to 3 p.m., there is actually a panel discussion um, that Kemp, our Riverkeeper, is going to be on. Um, it's called Cape Fear Conversations, and it's surrounding development and New Hanover County endowments priorities for the next few years. So um, that should be a really interesting talk. Um, there's, I think, seven people on the panel total. Um, and so, yeah, just right down the street later today if you're available. Um, next Saturday, we have our second Saturday cleanup at 9 o'clock. Um, you can um, come and ask me about that if you have questions um, after the seminar. The next Saturday, we have um, on fe Saturday, February 17th, we have our second uh, tree planting at Burnt Mill Creek, which is part of our three-year grant that we've received um, to help with restoration work on Burnt Mill Creek. So that is going to be at 11 a.m. on Saturday, February 17th. There's an online registration form um, on our website, and next week we'll be coming out in our e-news as well. If you're subscribed to our e-news, you can get those details there. Um, and lastly, next month on Saturday, March 2nd, our first Saturday seminar speaker is going to be Roger Shu. Um, so we hope you guys will all come back for that. I know he's a, he's a favorite. All right. So with that, I'm going to um, introduce our speaker today. So we're really, really excited to have Lindsay Addison here. Um, she's been Audubon, North Carolina's coastal biologist since 2011. Um, in this role, Lindsay and her staff um, supervise, that she supervises, they manage and monitor about 40% of the water birds that nest on North Carolina's coast. She serves on the American Oyster Catcher Working Group Steering Committee coordinates North Carolina's statewide oyster ca catcher banding program, and collaborates with academic and agency partners around the state on science and monitoring projects. Lindsay earned her undergraduate degree at Stetson University and her MS at Florida Gulf Coast University, where she studied, studied least turns nesting on natural beaches and rooftops. She's worked in birds and conservation since 2005 in Florida, Massachusetts, and California, and is grateful to have been born and raised in Southwest Florida. And so with that, I'm going to turn it on over to you, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marissa. Thanks for having me, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. And um, I am going to give you a little talk about what Audubon, North Carolina does on uh, the Lower Cape Fear River. And before I, I get into that, when I, I talk to, to groups, I always kind of like to explain sort of you know, what the Audubon Society is. So the point of Audubon is to protect birds and their habitats. And, and the reason that 
we're doing that in, in the present day is because of the feathers that are growing out of this bird's rear end. They're called egrets or nuptial plumes and herons and egrets grow these uh, during the spring in order to court and attract a mate. Uh, during the late 1800s and early 1900s, they also attracted attention from uh, the height of the fashion world, where it was all the rage for uh, women to wear feathers or even taxidermied parts or entire birds on their hats. Uh, this was really, really popular, um, so it was kind of uh, as an indication of, of just what, what uh, kind of pressure was exerted on these wild birds growing these feathers for their own purposes. Uh, in the early 1900s, an ounce of plumes was worth more than an ounce of gold. And so this, this led to incredible hunting pressure on these birds because they, the feathers were not being collected by picking them off, off the ground after the birds molted them. Instead, they would, uh, folks would go out to their, their nesting areas and they nest in large groups called colonies and they would basically shoot out the colony. And so this was a really unsustainable practice. And, and coupled with hunting pressure for commercial meat, it, it, back in the day, uh, it wasn't farm-raised birds necessarily. There was also uh, pressure um, on wild birds that were, were hunted kind of at an industrial scale for, for consumption. So this led to really severe declines in bird populations. And, and um, folks, largely in the Northeast, some society women in Boston, to be honest, got, got concerned about it. And they formed the early Audubon societies. And they did two things. One is they did advocacy and worked to write and pass model legislation that would protect birds. And that became the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which is the main uh, piece of federal legislation that protects birds to this day in North America. And they also hired people to go out two sites where birds nested uh, and protect them. This is one of the early Audubon wardens uh, down in Florida at the first National Wildlife Refuge uh, with a pelican that he's personally protecting. Um, he probably did not spend most of his days like that, but there's apparently a photo shoot because there's several different old black and white images of, of, of Paul Krogel and, and some, some kind of Victorian dressed women and some other men kind of milling around these pelican chicks who probably just wanted them to leave at that point. Um, but so it was successful. The, there, was, um, law, there were laws passed and the precursors to many state wildlife agencies were in fact Audubon societies. The, before there was a North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission to manage game and non-game species in the state, there was a, an Audubon society. So, so that's kind of cool. Um, and today, I work for Audubon, North Carolina, the state office of the National Audubon Society. And in our COAST program, we work at about 15 different sites, mainly in the southern half of the state, plus our Pine Island Sanctuary up in Currituck, uh, to protect birds along the coast. And we specifically, out of the Wilmington office, uh, protect uh, nesting birds at these sites. And the birds at those sites represent about 40% of the state's nesting coastal water birds. So species like pelicans, white ibis, egrets and herons, a variety of terns, 40% of those populations in the state are managed by, by um, Audubon, North Carolina. And as you may notice, germane to the subject of this talk, there are a cluster of sites down here in the Cape Fear area, including on the river. So our goal with having these sites is to do management of the sites, to monitor the sites, and, and to do research. So management is whatever you need to do in an area to make it better for your target species or your, your target plant. Or, um, so for birds, that could be things like putting up signs and string to keep people out of sensitive nesting areas. It can be doing habitat uh, <coughs> modifications like vegetation removal or vegetation plantings, as the case may be. So, so that's management. In order to know how your management is doing and what management might be needed, you've got to do monitoring. If you're not doing monitoring, you're, you're not really taking care of your site very well. So monitoring often devolves down to counting things in, in bird world. So, so I have a lot of Sesame Street skills. So you, know, you go out and there's some <laughs> birds, one, two, three. Um, so you monitor them, see how they're doing. Are they producing young? How many nesting pairs? How many non-breeding uh, birds are in these flocks year on year? And then finally, research is specific questions directed 
uh, usually for us, when we're uh, picking projects towards some kind of conservation, uh, conservation um, aim. And, and so overall, the point of having a, a sanctuary system within the Audubon Society of North Carolina is, is to preserve these sites for birds uh, and to have healthy state and regional populations and also to provide a place where students and others can come and do research. So sort of narrowing in on the Cape Fear River and specifically I'm talking about the lower Cape Fear River. So sometimes people define that as everything below the port or below downtown where we are here. Uh, for our purposes, this is going to be below Snow's Cut. So when you drive onto Carolina Beach, you go over the tall bridge into Carolina Beach. Hopefully there's no beach traffic because you're not going there on the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. Just go on the river. And so we've got about uh, 10 islands here. So Snow's Cut's actually up here. You've got Carolina Beach State Park and then a whole series of islands. And it's, a rather, it's, it's too small to really see, but we've got some different types of islands. We have natural marsh islands. We have islands that were created by dredging by the Army Corps of Engineers to maintain the river channel. Some of those islands received material back in the 50s or the 60s and didn't really get any more ever. And some actively receive dredge material still to this day or could. So, so that's, if, it's a little hard to see, but we've got just different colors of dots that show current active dredge sites um, and then natural islands and then kind of those historic dredge areas. And just on the Cape Fear River, we have about 25 to 30 percent, it's actually increasing, um, as you'll see in a minute, of the birds that nest on the coast of North Carolina on the river. So again, pelicans, ibis, egrets, herons, a lot of these species are concentrated on the Cape Fear River estuary. And these islands are owned by the state. We lease or have agreements with the state to manage them. And one of the nice things about the river is it provides a variety of different habitats. You've got marshy islands, you've got dredge islands that have recently received sand, so they're open sandy areas for those birds that want to nest on that type of substrate. We even have Battery Island, which has mature trees on it for birds that want to nest in mature trees. So there's a variety of different habitats that it can support species with different nesting needs. And I'm going to cover why I can tell you these things, and, and for any given year, I, I kind of round it off to 40%. We could give you a pretty accurate count. And the reason for that is every three years, all of the folks that, that manage bird nesting sites in the state are coordinated by the Wildlife Resources Commission to do a census. So for each species, folks go out to all of the nesting sites, and they try to count those those areas at peak of incubation when the most number of birds are sitting on the most number of nests. And in uh, the Cape Fear River, that can look like climbing through the trees on Battery Island and peering up at ibis nests. That's an ibis nest uh, with a, an egg in it. And, and you're counting nests, and then that stands in for the number of pairs. So there might be some sub-adults that aren't breeding, that are in the state during the breeding season, but don't yet go through the business of raising a family because, hey, it's a lot more relaxing if you don't have kids. <laughs> um, <laughs> but this gives us a pretty good approximation of, of our populations of breeding, breeding birds in North Carolina. We also have, on the dredge islands, species like terns that want to nest in, in sandier habitats. That's an example of a tern colony. Each of those little white dots is an egg. And so, so we, get a, a number, we get a number that is uh, uh, the number of pairs at the site and the number of pairs in the state. And so this, just as an example of how important the Lower Cape Fear River is to water birds, this is, uh, the light blue is the number of pairs of all water bird species in the census on the Lower Cape Fear River. The dark blue is all other sites in the state. And then this number at the top is the percent of birds nesting on the Cape Fear River. We don't have a complete count in 2020 because of COVID. But as you can see, we, we started off with 9% back when these surveys were started by Dr. Parnell in the 1970s. We started off with about 9%, thanks in part to the growth of pelican populations, um, white ibis deciding they really like Battery Island. Um, 
we ended up with uh, over 30 percent and uh, in 2017 over 40 percent uh, of, of the state's birds on the Cape Fear River. So it's pretty important. And I know people like to hear about birds in general. <coughs> and so I'll, I'll just kind of run through some highlights of some of the bird species that use the river. And everybody knows a pelican, and most people like them. Um, so the first species we'll talk about is the brown pelican. And we have between four and 5,000 pairs of brown pelicans nesting in the state in any given year. And they are a species that is quite flexible about where they want to nest. They will nest on the ground, they will nest in a tree, they will nest in a shrub. Uh, they will, um, in all cases, build a nice nest out of sticks and vegetation. This is a rather small one in terms of height sometimes, and this is pretty typical, but sometimes they'll be two or three feet tall before they finally stop building and get down to laying an egg. Those eggs are about twice the size of a chicken egg. Um, they're, they're large, they're white. They lay two to three of those, and then they have to incubate them for about a month, so that's kind of a long time to sit on it, but when it finally hatches, a little dinosaur comes out, <laughs> and you can decide if it's cute, or if it's ugly, or if it's both, um, but depending on how fast um, the chick grows, and that's dependent on if it has siblings, those of you with siblings understand that dynamic, um, and also depending on how uh, good the parents are at provisioning it with fish, which they, they bring in in their bellies and regurgitate to the chick. They do not carry fish in their pouch. Um, they learn to fly, get big enough, and grow the proper feathers to fly in two to three months. And um, on the Lower Cape Fear River, there was work done in the 1980s by a, um, a student who basically sat in pelican colonies. They got really habituated to him. and. He could see what they were bringing, regurgitating or bringing up for the chicks, and it was basically menhaden. So um, uh, a kind of a forage fish, maybe you know, a bit of a throwaway for us. That's not the fish we want to go out and catch as a recreational angler, but, but they're really important to the health of uh, a lot of other species populations. So that's the pelican. Um, next up, we've got egrets and herons. There's five species. Uh, nesting on the river, the great and the snowy egret, and then we've got the tricolored, little blue, black crown, night herons. And this is a great egret. This is an adult. This is a nearly grown chick. And all of these species nest just like the pelicans do in colonies, in groups. They, t they really do want to be in trees, so they're going to be in trees or shrubs. So they require islands that have got some type of, of established vegetation. All of their eggs are blue. And it kind of depends on the size of the bird. The, the smaller birds incubate for a slightly shorter period of time. Their chicks don't have to grow quite as much before they hatch. So somewhere between three to four weeks, the, the eggs will hatch. And then in a month to a month and a half, the chicks will be fledging. Like the pelicans, these guys feed their chicks regurgitated food. So it's interesting. They've done tracking studies on, on the parents. And they'll actually spend several days away from the colony while the other parent mines the nest. And then they, they trade off. So, so they kind of have these extended little mini breaks, which uh, seems like a pretty reasonable um, uh, compromise, especially when you watch the chicks uh, come uh, attack the, the, the parents for food. When the parents come in and the chicks know they're going to get fed, the, the way you stimulate your, your parent to feed you is, is you peck at their face. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's, that triggers the adult, oh, I'd better, I'd better vomit. And, <laughs> and so, you know, it, it makes having to do the airplane with the toddler seem a much more reasonable solution. <laughs> so if you ever get tired of doing that, like, why can't this kid just eat? It's, no, no, that's good. <laughs> He's not pecking your face with a sharp bill. Um, and speaking of face pecking, that's, that's how the ibis do as well. But um, Battery Island is, uh, or I should say the Cape Fear River is famous for having Battery Island, which is famous for having white ibis. It is globally significant as a nesting site for white ibis on the river, but they nest on some of the other islands as well. And they too like to nest in shrubs, but they will put a nest on the ground. Um, and they're kind of interesting about their nest. They're the only one of our, our birds that does it, but they'll bring in green vegetation to line the nest with. So leaves, it could be evergreen, could be deciduous, but you'll often see uh, fresh vegetation. This is actually, it's a little hard to see, but that's actually some fresh cedar some cedar um, greenery there in that nest. 
Their chicks are actually uh, black when they hatch out, and they're, they're quite adorable. Um, and then they, they kind of grow up to be these, these sort of teenagery things. They, they are, um, it's interesting, when they start off, when they're very young, they do not have a great ability to, to, ex to eliminate salt from their system. So the parents will go inland and forage in freshwater systems to provide them with food that doesn't have too much salt. And they grow the best, they grow the best on crayfish. So um, if you are a fan of crayfish, you have that in common with the ibis. And um, uh, I'll just say there is another species of ibis. It nests in very s well, small numbers in the state and small numbers on the river, so maybe 20 to 30 pairs. But we do have glossy ibis as well. So if you, if you uh, see a, 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 a decent-sized bird with a long down curved bill, some people, if they see any color that isn't white, they think they've seen a glossy ibis. They may have, but the way to tell for sure is if it's got a white belly. So a lot of people... Um, we'll see an uh, immature white ibis. So a bird that's less than two years old will be brown but with a white belly. So that'll be a young white ibis because it has to transition from being absolutely black to brown to white. Um, and a glossy ibis has got a black belly to go with black everything else. And it's kind of an iridescent, like a grackle. Um, so, so that's how to tell. But people often do get ibis in their yards or on the golf course or in the ditch at the side of the road. So. So that's kind of a, a common question, you can clear that up. The Cape Fear River is also a very important site for royal and sandwich terns. We usually have about 25 to 30% of the state's royal and sandwich terns nesting. And they are a species that wants to nest in open sandy areas. They nest in really dense colonies. And you can see here's just a tiny sliver of the, of the colony. We'll have two to 3,000 pairs all in in an area that's less than the size of this building. Mm -hmm. And then, so here's a closer up shot here. It's incubating. And then, oh, it's got a chick now. These are what their eggs look like. And all of these ones with the orange bills are the royal terns. The sandwich terns have got a black bill with a yellow tip. And you can remember, it's a sandwich tern. It's got mustard on its bill. <laughs> And what's interesting about these guys is they, they really, uh, most birds lay more than one egg called insurance, but these guys will, most pairs, the vast majority, 95% of them will just lay one egg. So they invest all this care on this one egg, this one chick, it's just a bunch of only children. The colonies are very loud. Um, I don't know if that's connected, but um, once the chicks are about two weeks old and they're really mobile, they can get up and walk around, they form basically a herd of chicks. It's called a creche. And so these, the group can move around. It can go to the, the, the breezy side of the island or the less windy side of the island, depending on if it's a nice day with a little bit of wind or if it's a storm and they want to get in the lee. So they can move around. They can go down to the water's edge, get a drink, cool themselves off. And the parents, as a group, kind of protect the chick group, but they only feed their own chick. And so they have a very cooperative form of breeding. And there's only five or six sites in any given year in the state with royal and sandwich terns nesting on it. And on the river, we have one to two of those sites, just depending on the year. Sometimes they're on uh, two of our sandy dredge islands, and, and some years they just want to be on one. So, so talk about putting almost all your eggs in one basket. So. Those are all species that nest in groups called colonies. And we do have non-colonial nesting birds on the river, mainly willets and oyster catchers. Very few people do work with willets, including us. So I'm sorry, willets. They, they exist. Um, but that's about all I could tell you about them um, <laughs> for purposes of this talk. But um, the other species that nests on the river that is a solitary nesting species, is the American oyster catcher. And they have been the focus of a lot of conservation effort because their population in the early 2000s was in a serious decline. It was very worrying. And a lot of effort has been put into reversing that trend. They're actually one of the few stories where you actually have, we actually have detected a population increase. So um, American oyster catchers on the river in the breeding season um, represent a very large proportion of the state's 
total oyster catcher nesting population. So there's no oyster catchers up here. These are these management areas that the um, Wildlife Resources Commission created. So we've got, um, we've got none up around Currituck, so Kerala, Duck, no oyster catchers up there. We've only got about 60 pairs kind of on the northern outer banks. We've got over 100 here around Carteret County. And then we've got, you know, another um, over 100 pairs down here. And Zone 5, which includes the Cape Fear River, has the most. And that is, uh, I believe, um, there's usually, it, it varies from year to year, but it's about 100 pairs on the Cape Fear River out of about 400 pairs in the state. So about 25% of the state's oyster catchers nest on the river. It's also a really important uh, site for non-breeding oyster catchers in the state. Um, if we have about 700 wintering pairs of oyster catchers, we have about 500 down here in, in Brunswick County um, and southern New Hanover County on the river. So the, a large proportion of, of that 500 is actually on the river itself. So, so important for birds, especially oyster catchers year round. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on the oyster catchers, they specialize on bivalves. They're one of the only birds that, that eats shellfish in this manner. You've got some kites that, uh, and a bird called a limpkin that eats snails. But uh, prying open bivalves is, is a behavior that's fairly unique to oyster catchers among bird world. And they nest um, on a variety of habitats. So they will nest on barrier island beaches. So you might see one on Masonboro Island. You can also see them in the marshes, on the river, and um, like a lot of birds that nest in, in, on sandy substrates, they just make a simple scrape. They don't build a nest out of sticks. It's just a little bowl in the sand. And they raise these chicks to fly in about 30 days, but the chicks are still learning how to pry open the shellfish because when they started off, they had a tiny little bill because it had to fit in the egg. And they have an instinct, but they do not have the skills to open the shellfish. So once they've fledged, their bill is still kind of finishing its growth and development, and they're still finishing their, their, their shellfish eating skills. And so the parents will subsidize them for another two to three months. And so we do this too. We send our kids to college. <laughs> um, and, uh, and like I said, these are, these are solitary nesting birds. So each pair has a territory, and if two pairs meet, they will have a dispute that looks like this. They, they make a loud piping sound and they, they chase each other and display posture. And so I talked a little bit about oyster catchers being present on the river during the winter as well as during the breeding season. And this brings me to the importance of the Cape Fear River for non-breeding birds. And a lot of birds that we have on the coast, specifically around sandy inlets and and other, other uh, coastal habitats are actually birds that nest in the, the Arctic. So these are a whole bunch of sandpipers and plovers. I call it a bird carpet because basically they just are so dense that you can't see the ground hardly. And this is mainly um, dunlin and short-billed dowagers. And you've got a few black-bellied plovers sprinkled in. And this is a, a bit of a closer view of, of some of these species. This is a black-bellied plover. Here's a dowager, dunlin, western sandpiper. Um, you'll just have to believe that's what they are because they kind of <laughs> look like little brown dots. Um, but um, I do recommend, you know, if you, if you have a chance to go bird watching with someone who can identify these things, and especially if they have a spotting scope, it, it really helps you to kind of uh, get a, a better sense of, of, of what they look like. A lot of it's based on size and shape rather than color for obvious reasons. But the river will support several thousand birds from the Arctic, these sandpipers that breed in the tundra and come down here to spend their winter. We'll have over 3,000 short-billed dowagers on the river. That makes it a regionally significant wintering site for short-billed dowagers and large numbers of these other species as well. So, so the, and it's these sandy features and the mud flats that make it suitable for these birds in the wintertime because that's where their food lives. These are not fish-eating birds like the terns. They're not prying open oysters like the oyster catchers. They're eating little invertebrates out of the sand. So sand shoals, 
mud flats, basically things with sediment. So you kind of want to see a lot of sandbars and features like that in your coastal areas because that will help to support these species. And most sandpipers and plovers that breed in the Arctic are in a decline due to many challenges including habitat loss and their uh, migration and wintering grounds. So, so having places like the Cape Fear River to, that can support them is really important. This brings us to the threats that birds face, and this isn't a, a talk focusing on that so much, but I do like to, to call out the challenges they face. First of all, habitat loss and degradation. So whether it's direct loss by development, just coming in and, and removing a, 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 a habitat that's being used by a bird or some other um, species of plant or animal, um, they, that is a problem. On the river, a huge problem is erosion, so excess wave energy. This can happen because of naturally occurring events like storms, but what's happening with climate change? We're getting more storms, more frequent storms, more intense storms, and, and what that can do is it can kind of flatten out areas that they need to nest. Here's a, a natural marsh island, and one of the features that's most important on the river are these, they're called shell rakes. They're basically deposits of old oyster shell, uh, some sand mix in there from back when there used to be an, an, um, more kind of inlet access between the river and um, the ocean. There's actually some really nice sand on the river, believe it or not. But uh, so ideally, these, these deposits of oyster shell would kind of be more upright and they would provide more supertidal, so habitat above the high, high tide line for nesting. And about half of the river's oyster catchers are on these types of habitats. But when you get really big storm events, if you get a lot of wave energy, it can kind of flatten those, those rakes down. And the other problem with the rakes is that obviously if you've got something made out of old oyster shell, you need a source of fresh oyster shell to sort of replenish them. And historically, there used to be a lot more oysters, and living oysters, on the Cape Fear River than there are now. So over harvest, historically, water quality issues have all contributed to declines in oyster populations. And there are a lot of people working on getting our oyster populations back up. And it would be great to have more healthy, really active oyster reefs around these sites um, to supply them naturally with oyster shells. So uh, this is a, a challenge. And of course, another problem with, with the river is that it is a heavily imp impacted channel. It's been dredged unnaturally deep. It's about 42 feet now so that we can have access to the Port of Wilmington for container ships and tankers. But this brings more wave energy in the form of ship wakes. And it, because you have a deeper body of water with stronger currents, more water coming up, more water going out. If you dig a deeper channel, more water can come in than if you have a shallow channel. It's just a question of volume. So we do have impacts from what people are doing directly in the area. We have impacts from climate change, and we just have natural impacts that would be happening regardless. So there's kind of a lot of different factors that go into to the quality of the habitat found on the river. So there's that. We also have uh, depredation, so predators. And in some cases, with things like a raccoon, we tend to subsidize these generalist mammalian predators that can be really, really hard on nesting birds. And the nice thing about the river is these islands are relatively small and they don't have a lot of other resources. So they don't support populations of mammalian predators. If we were talking about barrier islands, I'd spend a lot more time discussing problems with mammalian predators. But because we're on the river and we're on these relatively small islands, we have avian predators. This is a uh, immature bald eagle eating an oyster catcher chick, which it's backlit. This was a trail camera. so. Um, the trail camera doesn't expose properly for lighting conditions. It just shoots whenever there's motion. And mm -hmm. the motion on this particular uh, day was, was a bald eagle eating an uh, oyster catcher chick. Mm -hmm. uh, gulls are another important predator, as well as crows, for some of these nesting birds. They do have means of defending themselves. They'll, they'll fly at, they'll mob, they'll attack. Um, and they do recognize those species as predators. Flooding. So, Habitat degradation leads to more flooding because if you don't have as much elevation or if your island is eroding excessively, 
you're going to get more flooding. And also, if you have big waves, such as from container ships passing by, you're going to get more flooding. So this is another trail camera image. And this is um, one of our dredge material islands. And there was an oyster catcher nest in this circle here. And this whole beach, this used to be a, uh, in previous pictures, you, you would just see a, a kind of a sandy beach area. But right now it's a wash because a container ship has passed by recently. And as they go by, they suck all the water out and then they kind of throw it back up on the shore like a tsunami. It's a displacement wake. It's not the wake that you see when a motorboat drives by on the ICW. Um, it's kind of a, an under the water wave. So it's a big movement of water. And this oyster catcher, its eggs got washed out of the nest. You could see it in the, like the next sequence of pictures. It comes back and it, it kind of, they always look surprised because they have circular yellow eyes. <laughs> and it kind of looks at the situation and it, it is able to roll the eggs back into an area together. And they did actually hatch, but that is not the happy ending that many overwashed nests experience. And that is a big challenge. We have a blog post up recently on um, nc.audubon.org that has some more of these pictures. Um, that you can see if you want to see uh, mainly bad things happening because we were trying to show why we were using trail cameras. Um, and then finally, a big challenge to birds nesting anywhere, and less so on the river, but, but still an important factor, is, is anthropogenic disturbance. So, you know, if you've got an island with a bunch of birds nesting on it, and you've got some people having a beach picnic or their dog running around. You can imagine that's really incompatible with those parent birds being able to stay with their eggs or stay with their chicks. They get exposed to temperature stress. It's too hot. It's too cold. Um, they can obviously be stepped on. They can get eaten by an opportunistic predator like a gull that might swoop in if it sees that the parents aren't paying attention because they're distracted by the people. So all of these nesting islands are off limits to people during the nesting season. And we don't have a huge amount of kind of recreational boating activity on the river. There's a lot of recreational fishing, but just kind of the, the boating, driving around, pulling up on a beach. There's not a lot of that happening on the river. And that's really fortunate because we don't have to deal with that. But it is important to understand for folks that live on the coast that, that disturbance to birds isn't always just going into a nesting colony, even though the signs say not to, or ignoring the fact that a bird is having a freak out in front of you and maybe, maybe you should move away from it. It can also be seeing a flock of birds and walking through it, letting your dog chase the birds, letting your kids chase the birds, letting your grandkids chase the birds. <laughs> grandkids are a lot more appealing than kids, I understand. But uh, all of those things really shouldn't happen because it wastes these birds' energies. This is a flock of several thousand black skimmers. They're on their migration. They've stopped over here in the Cape Fear region in order to eat and get um, fit for the next stage of their journey. And if they're being repetitively flushed over and over, this wastes their energy. So just because they can fly doesn't mean they really want to be flying all the time, just as we all can run. We're human beings. We're designed to run. We're upright animals. We've got two legs. We're well balanced. Our feet, feet are nice and springy. But we, most of us, except for triathletes, do not want to run all the time. So, so just understanding that the disturbance comes in many flavors. Um, is this? Yeah, there we go. And so anyway, um, what are some things that we do with these birds to protect them, manage their habitat, understand them better? Um, one of the things about the, the, North, the state of North Carolina, and especially the river, is that dredge material can provide habitat for birds. So dredging can be good or bad, depending kind of on the project, how it's done, when it's done, the scope of it. And it really wasn't the intention of folks that were dredging back in the 50s and the 60s to make bird habitat, but they ended up doing that. So they created the two active dredge islands that we have on the river today are called Ferry Slip and South Pelican. And when they were created in 1969 or 1970, they were just a convenient place to put material that was dredged out of the river channel. But the very next year, a bunch of birds came, royal terns came, and decided to nest on them. And so, as natural habitat is lost, either due to too many people being on the coast, too much recreational pressure from human beings, too much development, or just loss from erosion, um, they became very dependent on dredge material islands. 
And for royal turns and sandwich turns in particular, you can see this is the percent, so you, it goes all the way up to 100%. The percent of royal turns nesting on dredge islands is 98 to 100% in the past 10 years. And the percent nesting on natural islands is like hardly any at all, 1 or 2%. And just to give you an idea of the scale, we have about 12,000 pairs of royal terns nesting in the state. So, so if we have a really big natural island colony, it's, it's like 150 of them, as opposed to on the Cape Fear River, we'll have 2,500, 3,000 pairs on, on the, the dredge islands. And I should point out, oh, before I talk about vegetation management, is that because these uh, species like to nest on open sandy habitats, eventually vegetation starts to grow up. There, there's a dredge material deposit, the vegetation gets smothered, we get, go back to really good turn habitat, and the cycle repeats itself. But we don't get dredge material on the bird schedule. Sometimes the islands go for years and years without getting any. And so we do some vegetation management with the Wildlife Resources Commission's Habitat Division, and they have a ATV that, and a really nice uh, john boat that comes out on the island. We uh, apply herbicide as needed do some burning, and we, we try to limit this to only as needed, but if we didn't do it, we would just basically have a, a grassy mound that really wasn't useful for, for nesting birds at all. And another good thing about this is we do have um, a lot of gulls on the river, and they like to nest in the vegetation. And they also mm -hmm. nest in the marshes, and that is where they should be. And so by limiting the amount of vegetation on the dredge material islands, you eliminate a predator species from being in such close proximity to some of your species with a greater conservation need. So you've got some populations are more robust, some need more help. So it's very nice to keep the galls away from the oyster catchers and the terns. And uh, we also get to play with fires, so that's fun. <laughs> and. Um, just to kind of show you what it looks like when these islands get sand is, whoop, whoa, wrong button, is um, the basically when they're maintaining the, the navigation channel for the shipping traffic, there'll be a pipeline dredge. So basically a big suction, like a kind of a, you know those old egg beaters? Oh, yeah. Yep. At the, and so you've got that at the, the, the end of a pipe, and it's churning, churning, and churning. And it, it's got water in there, too. So it creates a mix of the sand and the water, and that's called a slurry. And then there's a, some pumps, and they kind of create a suction. And they suck it up in this pipe, and the pipe runs up onto the island. There's the pipe. And the slurry, the mix of sand and water, comes out, and the sand, the grains of sand fall out. The water goes back into the river. And we're trying to protect. There's a little wetlands right here that just naturally formed on this dredge island. And so there's a berm to kind of control where, where the sand goes so you're not smothering a wetland. So this is, this is kind of like what happens in a beach nourishment project as well. And so unfortunately, South Pelican Island has not received sand since 2004. This Google Earth happened to capture the project. It didn't take long for vegetation to grow back. But with our habitat management with the Wildlife Resources Commission, we do have a nice sandy area. And it is the favored turn island right now. Our other dredge material island, Ferry Slip Island, was getting smaller and smaller and more and more vegetated. And you can kind of see, here's the 2004 shoreline in blue, 2010 in yellow. And it really had gotten quite small. It was, it was, it was about three acres um, by the time we got word that the Corps said, we need to do a dredge project. And which island would you like us to try to put your material on? And so we picked Ferry Slip. And so we do work with the Army Corps of Engineers so that when they do have material that can be used beneficially for wildlife, it is. And so this is an Army Corps of Engineers navigation project. Here's the pipe coming up onto Ferry Slip Island. You'll notice it looks a lot better than in the aerial imagery because we had been doing the vegetation management. Here they are placing the sand. This is the plume of slurry popping up out of the pipe. And then they, they shape it with the bulldozer. You can imagine, like, this is salt water. These, they go through these machines very quickly. <laughs> um, but it was really, really nice, and now it's happy again. So you can see how it looks. Uh, again, thanks to Google Earth imagery, um, this is what it was in 2021. And you can see it's gotten nice, 
It's gotten a lot bigger. We attracted some new species back to the river that hadn't been there in over 10 years, namely black skimmers. So now we have a, another species on the river. And so that's really, really kind of a win-win story. So people often kind of like to know, oh, well, is dredging bad for bad or good? And it's like, well, tell me about the project, and we can kind of evaluate the pros and cons of it. Um, sometimes it can be used for, for, for useful purposes, especially considering all of the other anthropogenic impacts that we're experiencing along the coast. Another project that we've been involved in um, with funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and in collaboration with uh, the UNCW Center for Marine Science is putting some oyster reefs back on the lower Cape Fear River. And so we, we worked with Troy Alpha and some of his students um, to develop a siting model for where would be a good location for new oyster reefs. We had them, they were looking at things that were important for the oysters, like substrate, presence of spat. But we also looked at where the oyster catchers were nesting because we wanted these reefs to be kind of in a place where they could help to replenish in the long term the shell rakes and perhaps provide a little bit of shoreline stabilization along the way. And so this is the installation of our first reef, and we have three others that um, we're waiting to hear about. There's always some different funding uh, opportunity that you're waiting to hear about. So we're waiting to hear about potentially um, funds for, for building the, the remaining reefs. But um, this is a nesting, oyster catcher nesting rake along here. You can see kind of the, the lighter area. That's the, the shell rake. And so this reef is kind of going in a place where there used to be an oyster reef. When I started in 2011, there was kind of the remnants some old oyster shell that when you were boating around at high tide, you kind of had to avoid this one area because that was where the old reef was. And it's since completely fallen apart. It's not there anymore at all. And the reason these rakes exist is because, you know, I don't know how long ago, 50 years, 100 years ago, there were really happy oyster reefs in that area. So we're kind of trying to, to get some reefs back. Um, another island that we're quite interested in and concerned about, of course, is Battery Island. It's located right down where the river, um, we have to make a sharp turn following the river channel along Oak Island, going up um, um, parallel to the Southport shoreline. And so it's, it's kind of located right at the mouth, a lot of energy, the ships are coming around it. Uh, the Baldhead Island Ferry is hitting it with those giant wakes every 30 minutes, two ferries passing. So there's a lot of erosional pressure on Battery Island. And this shaded area here is the main ibis colony. So this is our tree thicket. And this is where dredge material was placed back in the kind of the first half of the 1900s. Never got any more, but it kind of created this, this elevated area that, that was eventually colonized by, by yaupon, red cedar, and unfortunately mulberry. The mulberries aren't as useful to the ibis as the other species of trees. But we did a really nice project with Devin Yuli and some of her students uh, at UNCW. They mapped some of the historical shorelines and they calculated a shoreline change rate. And so uh, all of this was done before Hurricane Florence, but they projected that if nothing really changed to the circumstances, the, the dark blue line is the projected shoreline in 2035, and that would start to encroach into the Ibis colony. And thanks to a series of hurricanes, Florence, Dorian, Isaias, we kind of got a jump start on that. So their prediction is being borne out. So we are working with um, the UNCW College of Engineering to gather some additional data such as waves and currents that have never been collected for the area before. And we also got funding from the North Carolina Land and Water Fund uh, to do some, uh, basically a, a, a design project to design some form of protection for Battery Island and then to get that permitted because you have to go through a, a permitting process with, through the state and the federal government before you can do any type of work like that. So, so we are working to try to do something for Battery Island to ensure that this island, which is really unique uh, among islands on the river and indeed in the state, having a mature tree forest and not supporting those mammalian predators that would make it inaccessible or unuseful for nesting birds. So we're, we're working hard to try to move this along. It's been a long, slow process. Um, but 
um, it's very important to keep Battery Island and keep it functionally available for these birds. Also on the river, we do a lot of work monitoring bird nesting, and, and that's again, so we know how they're doing. We wouldn't have thought about, oh, we need to do something about these oyster reefs and these shell rakes if we hadn't been monitoring oyster catcher productivity and realizing how many nests we lose to flooding events, just to king tides. You guys probably, if you, if you live downtown, you get those, those flood alerts, you know? It seems like every time there's a full moon, right? It didn't used to be that way. I mean, I, got, I have the same apps on my phone as when I moved here, and I didn't get as many coastal flood advisories as I do now. So the same things that affect the parking lots downtown at the base of the, the uh, riverfront affect the birds on the river. So, so we do a lot of work with oyster catcher monitoring because they're a really good umbrella species. They nest in a variety of habitats. So if you monitor oyster catchers, you're kind of going to all of these other, all the islands that are supporting all these other species as well. So productivity monitoring is figuring out how many young are being produced. So we find a pair, we find their nest, we see if it hatches, we see if the chicks survive. And we, um, I've been working with a variety of different folks around the oyster catcher breeding range in the United States to develop an app. So we have a, a unified protocol that everyone uses and an app to put all that data into. So that's really streamlined our process. And then the other thing that we do in terms of um, monitoring the oyster catchers is we banned most of the oyster catchers that fledged from the river and from other sites that we manage as well. And this allows us to understand their demographics and their movements. And this is a really important aspect of uh, being able to manage oyster catchers because they have high site fidelity. They come back to the same place to breed every year. They often have the same mate. So you can track individuals across the course of their lifetime. You could see if there's any particular age class where you're hitting a bottleneck. Like, yeah, I'm fledging a lot of chicks, but not a lot of those chicks are returning to breed. So you can kind of understand where, where pinch points might be. So we, along with pretty much every other agency that manages oyster catchers in the state, also bans them. And we can learn a lot about the habitats that they use while they're not with us when they're moving away and spending their winters elsewhere. So all oyster catchers that have been seen on the Cape Fear River, so this is all banded oyster catchers. This is all the other places that they've been seen. And so we, you can see we have some wintering birds. We have some Massachusetts. We have some Connecticut birds. We've got some from New York and New Jersey that come down in winter. And this is the Cape Fear right here. We also have kind of movements within the state. So the birds that are nesting on the Outer Banks, some of those will come down in winter on the river. And then birds that breed on the river or fledge are moving south and wintering in the Georgia Bight and in Florida along the Gulf Coast especially. And you can also see just this is just all oyster catchers that either nest or hatched off of the Cape Fear River. And you can see again, it's mainly moving south for the winter. But there's still a whole lot of dots right here. And that's because a lot of the birds that nest, a lot of the oyster catchers that nest on the river are actually resident. They never leave. So a lot of times people want to know, oh, is that bird migratory? And it's like the species is migratory, but the individual might not be. So it's really interesting what you can learn. We've also been tracking their fine scale habitat use, which will help us to design and site future habitat restoration or enhancement projects. So we basically put a little satellite transmitter on their back, and um, it talks to the GPS satellites that, that talk to your phone, and it records really accurate location data. And we wanted to look at how they were using habitats in different landscapes. So dredge islands, which do not have a lot of shellfish resources on them. Natural islands, which usually do have shellfish resources right there next to where they're breeding. And barrier islands, which sometimes do and sometimes don't have access to shellfish. And so one of the things that we were interested in is, is there, how far do the parents have to go when they're um, in the chick rearing stage in order to, to forage? And so this is Fairy Slip Island. This is the epicenter of all these dots. And you can see it's having to, the, this tagged bird is having to go fairly far away off of Fairy Slip to get food. And when it's raising a chick, that might influence how well they can protect the chick because 
it's great to have both parents right there watching the precious child, right? You want to be a helicopter parent when you've got galls that want to eat your baby. <laughs> but if one of you has to go forage and then come back and the other one of you has to go forage, that's only one adult to look after, possibly up to three different chicks. So being able to be really attentive to your chick is sometimes related to being able to, whether you want to be able to feed your chick or not. Now, on the other hand, here on Shellbed Island, which is one of these natural shell rakes that I uh, was showing you, this bird is basically able to stay right there all the time. And it takes a break sometimes. It goes over here. These are some nice um, mud flats that it's probably getting some, some delicious cohogs off of. Um, and uh, you, know, you can really see how the difference in how well they're able to stick to that nest and stick to that, stick to that um, chick during the chick rearing process. So we're in the process of, of writing that manuscript up. Our collaborator, Kate Goodenough from the University of Oklahoma, um, was, uh, is in the process of writing that. So hopefully there'll be a, an article coming out soon. And we also tracked birds um, at Pea Island National Wildlife Refuge and at the um, at, uh, Cape Lookout National Seashore. And we did get funding from the Carolina Bird Club to help us to buy data loggers. Back to our collaboration with UNCW, um, one of uh, Dr. Emsley's and Dr. Scrabble's students, Anna Zarn, um, spent several years with us collecting bags of mud, which also contained oysters and mussels, um, among other things, in order to turn them into pretty graphs of mercury. So, so the Cape Fear River has you know, been industrialized and has a lot of different sources of contamination. And one of those, those um, contaminants is, is mercury. So she was looking at mercury levels. And instead of just looking at them in one species, like I'm just going to pluck the feathers off a pelican and see if there's some extra mer mercury in there, we were looking at an entire food web. So she was taking sed sediment samples from the shellfish beds. She was taking shellfish. We were getting um, mercury levels from the eggshells and feathers of oyster catchers. So the eggshells tell you about what the mother bird was carrying. And the feathers tell you about what the chick was carrying. Um, and um, we, she also looked at prey fish that were regurgitated by the terns and at the terns and their feathers. And so by looking at the food chain, she was able to show that, yes, there's biomagnification taking place, which is where mercury, because animals don't expel it, they just kind of they have it in them. And then when they get eaten by another animal, it just concentrates even more as you move up each trophic level in the food web. And so the, the terns, which are eating higher up in, in the, uh, on the food chain, had more mercury, so evidence for biomagnification. And it was also very interesting. We started collecting right after Hurricane Florence, and that churned up the river something fierce, did it not? And so we saw a spike in um, levels of mercury following uh, the passage of Hurricane Florence. And this is interesting because there are other events that churn up sediments in the river as well, things like dredging. So one of the impacts you have to think about when evaluating a big dredge project is how many different types of contaminants are you going to resuspend and make available to be taken up by wildlife or by people um, in the wake of that, that action. So we're continuing to do a little bit of background monitoring with, with uh, Dr. Emsley. I'm just collecting more of these Ziploc bags. Um, uh, each each uh, June or July, kind of at the, the time when the oyster catchers are, are raising their chicks, and uh, we're still collecting some eggshells opportunistically. So, so it kind of provides a lab experience for some lucky undergrads. But um, <laughs> so we've been doing that. Also talking about things you don't really want to be eating, um, PFAS. So uh, probably if if you weren't here in 2017, you probably found out. But uh, in 2017, we we learned that that. Camorras had been dumping um, Gen X and other, other types of PFAS in the river for 40 years. And that wasn't really good news for anybody. And as soon as we found out about this, this was just kind of a, a lucky happenstance. Is several years ago, or several years before 2017, um, uh, uh, then a master's student, Anna Roebuck, was working on Masonboro Island. And we met her because she was doing some bird monitoring. And she went on to the University of Rhode Island 
and was getting her PhD in seabirds. And, and I can't remember if she contacted me or I contacted her, but as soon as I found out about this PFAS, I was like, hey, do you want some chicks? Because I knew she was doing contaminants, or she knew I, and I was on the river. And so we picked up some chicks that just, there's a lot of background mortality in a bird colony. Not all the eggs hatch, not all the chicks survive. So we collected some, some deceased chicks, and she, um, as part of her PhD, analyzed their tissues, muscle, um, liver, kidney, to, to look for different types of PFOS in them. And she compared them to other samples of birds from Narragansett Bay and the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And so the Cape Fear River, I know this is really basically impossible to read, so I could be putting anything, but the Cape Fear River is the yellow dots. These are all different types of PFOS, and you'll notice that the yellow dots tend to be higher than the, the blue and the gray dots, which are the other two sites. So basically, in 2017, we had, relative to other sites, really high levels of PFOS in birds on the Cape Fear River. And we were kind of stuck there for a few years uh, in search of um, collaborators to kind of take the next step. So, okay, there's these substances in these birds. How might it be affecting them? Because it's really, really hard to do longitudinal studies on the health of even human beings, um, let alone a wild animal who, who, you know, you can't like send them an email and say, hey, it's time for your, your blood draw and health check. I'm part of the NC State um, PFAS study in people. Um, and so I thought turnabout was only fair play that I would take my experience and put it into, onto some pelican chicks. But we did find, so we found um, a lab with the um, U.S. Geological Surveys out of their, um, out of their Patuxent office and um, Amanda Williard in UNCW who mainly does turtles but birds are more evolved reptiles so she was willing to come on in. And, and work with us as well. So we started collecting blood samples from pelicans. So why do we care about the blood of pelicans? Well, the blood is kind of your immune system. That's where your immune system lives in large part. And PFOS can affect the ability of your immune system to fight off infections. Um, you probably or may have heard about work with striped bass and American alligators. So by taking samples of blood from the pelicans, basically you send it off to this the USGS people who are smarter and more educated than I am, and they basically take those blood samples and they challenge the blood samples with different pathogens and they see how well the blood from these pelicans can mount an immune response. So you're, you're getting a sense of not only the amount of PFOS that may or may not be in their blood, but also how well the immune systems of those birds are responding. So we took blood samples from these pelican chicks on the river this is the pelican chick. It's a white blob, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and these are some lovely volunteers. And um, we took some samples, not only from the river, but from an island that we own up at Ocracoke Inlet. So that was kind of our control site, although I really don't know how clean anything is in the state anymore. So um, um, there, we're still in the waiting for the analyses to be done stage, but we'll be collecting another round of samples this year, so we should have um, a really good idea of, of what we're dealing with now several years on from the initial um, bad news about PFAS. And then finally, um, a few other things that we do. We, a lot of our work um, is kind of long term, so we have these smaller projects like the Annas and Annas that we're looking at these contaminants, uh, but then we kind of have these longer term work studying the productivity of the oyster catchers and also banding birds on the river. Um, so we just started putting out uh, field readable bands on royal and sandwich terns, which are similar to the, the bands that are on the oyster catchers. They're designed to be read by someone with uh, binoculars or a spotting scope or a camera with a zoom lens in the field. So when you're looking, you know, on the coast at a bird, and it's it's Look at its legs, too. It's not pervy. It's, it's for science. Um, and um, so we, we have got, got field readables on, on royal turns. Um, we'll be doing that for a little while. Um, we'll also be doing some uh, satellite-based tracking of the royal turns getting started. We'll, um, we banned skimmers as well, which because we have a little skimmer colony on the river now, we're banding the skimmers on the river. and um, 
we, we aren't really doing any pelican banding work anymore, but for years and years, pelicans were banded. So if you ever find a dead pelican on the, the coast, um, it's kind of worth looking at its legs, you know, kind of nudge it over, you know, see if you could see a leg or two. Um, and all you need is the number. You don't have to touch it. You don't have to take the band with you. It's okay to leave the band. It's also okay to take the band if you want it. Um, it could kind of be a really gnarly thumb ring. Um, but, um, but so we do that work annually. And um, if you have any questions, I would be very happy to entertain them. These are the lovely folks who um, provided their photos for this. And um, if you are interested in any of these projects in more detail, each one of those could be a talk. Um, some of them have papers that have already been published. Some are in press, so you're, you're welcome to follow up, and I could provide you with, with links or PDF or just, well, it's coming, just be patient um, if you're interested in reading more about that. And um, thank you guys so much for your time on a Saturday morning. It's really great to be here.